Let's turn in our Bible this morning to 2 Peter chapter 3, and you may notice that we're getting close to the end of 2 Peter. It's a very short epistle, but it's taken us a very long time. The end is in sight. A couple more messages to go. This morning we want to look at verse 14. I'm going to invite you to follow along as I read verses 11 through 15. And we want to look at verse 14 and talk about being found in him in peace. Being found by him in peace. Second Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the comfort and encouragement that it is to us, even while it gives us warning, as well as direction, where we should fine-tune our focus and our gaze. Help us, Father, to be looking at those things that you have instructed to us in your word to be looking at, and that we may be found by Jesus Christ when he returns in your peace. We look to you now in joy and pray that your spirit will give us understanding, and we ask in the name of our Master, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God has revealed in his word, we've been looking together, his plans for the future. And here in 2 Peter chapter 3, we see judgment is coming upon the wicked. All wickedness and ungodliness of men are going to experience the wrath of God. Peter's been dealing with that as we begin now in verse 14 through the end of this epistle. Verse 18 is now Peter's conclusion to the whole matter. In chapter 3, he uh, talks a little bit about the false teachers that he gave warning about in chapter 2, these mockers, uh, these false teachers are mockers because they are not believing that Jesus Christ is coming again. Um, Peter reminds us that Jesus Christ is going to return. And Peter's focus has been not on the rapture, that's the return that we are looking for in Second the, uh, yeah, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, when believers in Jesus Christ will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Peter has been focusing on when Jesus returns to this earth. And the angels who attended Jesus' ascension, as recorded in Acts chapter 1, said that this same Jesus is going to come in like manner as you have seen him go. Very, very different, by the way, these two events. The rapture is described in 1 Corinthians 15 as taking place in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And those who are in dead in Christ will be caught up, and then those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But when Jesus Christ returns on, to this earth, as recorded in Revelation chapter 19, in detail, it's prophetic, but it's detailed, he's going to come in the same way he went. It's going to be very visible. And as Jesus promised in Matthew 25, every eye will see him. Every eye as he returns to this earth. That's going to be, as Peter has been detailing here, a day of judgment, the day of the Lord. And it's going to bring forth the day of God, the future reign of Christ that will culminate in eternity, the new heavens and the new earth. And we've been reading about that. God reveals that. And God reveals to us in his word that it's the responsibility of beloved ones to be waiting for our Lord Jesus and to be constantly enthusiastic about living our life for Jesus Christ. That's been the whole epistle. Sum up all of Second Peter. 
in that statement. And we see it here in verse 14. Therefore, because we know these things that God has revealed, the day of the Lord, the day of God, the coming judgment, and what Paul has revealed in his epistles, verse 15, Peter admits this is challenging. We alluded to the rapture. Peter alludes to that. We're looking for the blessed hope when we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But Peter said, because of that, beloved, we're looking forward to these things. There ought to be a diligence. And there ought to be a diligence that we should be found by him uh, when Jesus Christ returns in a very particular way, in peace, without spot, and also blameless. Notice, please, first of all, the word beloved. Uh, I'm going to ask three questions today. All my message is going to be centered around three questions. Will you be looking for our Lord? I could say, are you looking for our Lord? And then number two, will you be diligent? I could say it, are you being diligent? And then thirdly, how will you be found when he returns? If Jesus Christ should come while we were still alive, before we've passed on, how will you be found? The good challenging questions. The first one, will you or are you looking for the Lord? Peter opens up by saying, therefore, beloved. Beloved. This is a beautiful word. These words don't have any meaning for you unless you are in the beloved. If you are in the beloved, then you are beloved of the Lord. Did that confuse you? I hope not. God spoke from heaven. We've said it more than once already in our study. When Jesus was baptized at the River Jordan by John the Baptist, God the Father spoke from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When you turn to Jesus Christ in faith and receive him as your Savior, according to Ephesians 1, you are accepted in the beloved one, Jesus Christ. And as such, we then find the love of God demonstrated toward us, in us, through us. We are beloved. This word beloved here comes up six times in the second epistle of Peter. Peter uses it six times. John the Apostle uh, used this word as well. Peter uses it six times, and uh, he uses it once in chapter 1. Look at 2 Peter 1, verse 17. And he there details what we just alluded to. Jesus received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him, to Jesus, from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is the beloved one. All five times that this word appears is now in our chapter, chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, this word comes up in verse 1. Peter opens up chapter 3. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle. And he speaks of believers in Jesus Christ as beloved. It's also in verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And you've been, if you've been with us, you know that is not a prophetic key. That is a comparison. Peter is reflecting on the writings of Moses in Psalm 90. Our God is from everlasting to everlasting. And uh, with God, uh, a thousand years is like just the evening watch that is gone. Time with God is not uh, a big issue. It is with you and I. <laughs> we are with you and me. We are in time. And so we experience the moments of our days. But God holds time in his hands. And he operates from eternity. And so what may seem like a very long time to us, 2,000 years is a long time. It's a very short time with God. Because God puts it in the context of eternity from where he works. Well, Peter also mentions this word in verse 14, our text this morning. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things. But he also mentions it again in verse 15 and 17. And in verse 15, he speaks of the Apostle Paul as his beloved brother. I'm going to save my comments for next week. That is an amazing phrase and an amazing demonstration of the work of God in a believing heart. But come next week for that one. And then lastly, in verse 17, You therefore, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware, beware. What it helps us, the only reason I detail that is it helps us to understand that Peter 
is reaching out to believers in Jesus Christ in this chapter, and he's sharing something with them that's very personal and very endearing. They are endeared to him because they are believers in Jesus Christ just like he is, and they are a part of that common faith that we have in Jesus Christ, and so they're brothers and sisters in Christ, but he's very concerned that they not get taken up and taken away with the error of the wicked. Be careful. Beloved of the Lord, pay attention. Pay attention. Will you be looking for our Lord, beloved? The word for looking here means to be waiting. It means to be expecting. That's what the word means. When you're waiting for something, you're looking. I had the blessed experience many, many moons ago after I was a driver for not very long, but I was graduated from high school, attending a Bible institute. I not only had a driver's license, but I also had a car. Great independence comes when you have a car, doesn't it? It's a wonderful thing. You can go here and there. But when the car break down, when she no go, neither do I, unless I could walk, ride a bicycle, or get a friend to give me a lift. And in this case, to get to work was more than seven miles. So I was looking for a friend to give me a lift. And so when I got out of Institute, we set it up by our watch. At such and such time, will you pick me up? Yes, I will come by. And so there I stood on the corner of Wynn and Wyman Street, and I was looking and waiting, and they weren't on time. And I was looking and waiting because I was waiting for a ride to work. I was at their, I was at their uh, mercy, wasn't I? Until they got there, well, I could start walking, but if I did, they wouldn't find me. <laughs> Maybe miss me, I don't know. They came, thankful, I'm glad I waited. But that's the idea of the word here. Beloved, looking forward to these things, that is waiting for them. You're looking, waiting. This word, looking, is found in Acts chapter 28, verse 6. You don't need to turn there. You can if you want to later on. In Acts chapter 28, verse 6, the account is when the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked with other prisoners, and God spared all their lives, but they made their way into the island on shore. And as they were getting off on shore, some of the natives there were very kind to begin to build a fire for them to warm them before they could secure passage to Rome where they were being taken. By the way, not one life was lost through the shipwreck, just as Jesus told Paul. He said, stay in the boat, no life will be lost. But you know what? This is interesting. They all ended up having to get out of the boat in order to all be saved. Things change, but God's will does not. God didn't change when it was time to get out of the boat. They all got out of the boat. Some could swim. Some could just hang on to a piece of wood. They all made it to shore. Not one life was lost. And in the midst of a fire being built to dry them out and to help them to just recover from this shipwreck after being in this storm, as the Apostle Paul worked with everyone, bringing a bunch of sticks to the fire, we're told a viper was in that bunch of sticks. And it came out and latched on to Paul. It bit him. And the natives, we're told, looked at Paul. Acts 28, verse 6. And it says for a long time, because they were familiar with the snakes in their region, and they knew that this was a poisonous snake, and they knew how poisonous it was, undoubtedly by experience. They were expecting Paul to drop dead. But Paul just shook the viper off. And they concluded after looking for a long time, he must be a god, lowercase g. They couldn't account for how anyone could be bit by that viper and not drop dead because they didn't know God. But Paul did. It was, not Paul, it was not God's purpose for Paul to die in that moment. And by the way, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you will not die until it's time for you to go home unless you rebel against God and do something very, very foolish. God will preserve and keep you as you are serving him until he appoints the time for you to be in his presence. That means be faithful. Paul just shook it off. When they were looking at Paul and at those bite marks, they were waiting for Paul to drop dead. They were waiting. That's, that's our word. That's what we have here. Beloved, looking forward to these things. Waiting, looking for these things. What things? Well, the things specifically that have been talked about are, notice in verse 12, this word says, looking, it's the same word, 
looking and hastening the coming day of God. The day of God. We're looking for the day of God. Verse 13, nevertheless, we according to his promise, look. It's the same word as in verse 14. Three times. Look. What are we looking for? New heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. We saw that last week, didn't we? Heavenly home. No more suffering. No more pain. No more sickness, no more sadness, no more dying, no more sun. The Lamb is all the glory that lights up our heavenly home, the new heavens and the new earth. Since we are looking for these things, are you looking for the Lord Jesus Christ? It's a good question. When we're reminded of these things, if you're a believer in Christ, we should be moved to say, yes, I'm listening for the trumpet sound when Jesus Christ will return. But when we get caught up in the world, we have to remind ourselves because our focus easily gets moved astray. Peter writes, Beloved, we are looking forward. We're waiting for God to bring to pass all that he has revealed in his word. All that God has promised, he has fulfilled. And so all that God has promised that has not yet been fulfilled, it will surely be fulfilled in God's time. And beloved of the Lord are looking. Now, there's a command and the command in this verse is be diligent. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blemish. The word diligent here, the word spudazzo, means to make haste, to give diligent. It came up in chapter 1, verse 15. This word was used when Peter said, Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease, after Peter died. He was going to make sure that those who heard him could always reflect upon these things. How so? We talked about it in our study. Peter, like the other apostles, were careful to record the truths that Jesus gave to them. They were careful to record the truths that the Holy Spirit of God gave to them so that you and I have the New Testament together with the Old Testament. Aren't you thankful for that? In this verse, chapter 1, verse 15, it's translated, be careful. I will be careful or be diligent. I will put an enthusiastic energy into making sure that you can always be reminded of these things. And I to, I, to the Lord, am so very thankful because you and I can read this truth today. We have the truth of God preserved for us because Peter was diligent. Are we being diligent? Are we being energetic? Are we pouring into the looking and watching for our Lord Jesus Christ, a tremendous energy that we're going to see should be focused in a particular direction. I pray that we are. The word here, as I said, is a command. It's not an option. We are told to be diligent. We are told to be watching for all that God has promised he will accomplish. This means our focus is gazed up on the truth of God and the will of God that he has revealed in his word. We have to be careful, though we occupy in this world, we need to keep our attention on biblical things, heavenly things, our heavenly goal. Listen, if you are not careful to keep your mind and thinking on things above, you will be surely disappointed. This world is filled with all kinds of disappointments. If you are gazing intently upon laying up treasure here on earth, if your focus and your busyness is all about you've not only provided, those are important things. God says if someone doesn't provide for their own family, we're told in his word, you're worse than an infidel. I'm not talking about being engaged and being responsible and taking care of our needs and providing. That's important and we should be engaged in it. But like the rich man who, when God gave him so much produce, he st instead of looking for how he could use that extra produce to honor the Lord, he said, I'm going to build up bigger barns, more barns. My soul, take your rest. Live at ease. Jesus said, be careful. He didn't know that that very night his soul would be required of him. This world is filled with change constant change and many things can bring forth change in this world the believer is to be focusing our gauge and engaging our energy in an enthusiastic diligence into looking for God and also using what God blesses us with to further the name and the testimony the very work of God 
and take heart. There are rewards that are promised for those who diligently lay up treasure in heaven. God will reward greatly. The Apostle Paul understood that. He understood and he said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, the crown that God's going to give to all those who love his appearing. Why? Because they're watching. Watching for the return of their Savior and they're diligent in moving in that direction. All right, will you be watching? Will you be diligent? That brings us to our third question. Will you be found? Peter says, to be found by him in peace. The word here, to be found, is telling us that we are in such a state, in such a situation where when the Lord comes, he's going to examine the state and the situation in which he finds us. What situation should he find us? The answer is peace. To be found by him in peace with two adjectives, spotless and blameless. Will you be found in the peace of God, spotless and blameless? You'll only do that as you're abiding in Christ. The word spotless here, unspotted, and it's used by James. In James chapter 1, verse 27, James writes, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Unspotted from the world. What did James mean? I do want you to turn with me to James chapter 4. He went on a little later in his epistle to explain what he meant. James chapter 4. Unspotted from the world. We're familiar with being spotting. The idea here of spotted and blameless brings to mind how the Jews were required to bring their sacrifice, their lamb that they would bring, a lamb without blemish, without spot. That's the idea of these words. But here, Peter's talking about us as believers being without spot, not being stained by any spots. I've shared before, it just comes to mind as an illustration. For me, that's hard to do when I eat spaghetti. When I eat spaghetti, I seem to always get a spot on me somewhere. And so my shirts go into the laundry. Why? That they might be spotless when I put them on. Remove those spots. To be stained. That's the idea of this word spotless. Notice here in James chapter 4, verse 1, James goes on. What he meant by spotted from the world is explained here. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your own desires for pleasure? that war in your members, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it upon your pleasures, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity at God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This world system that according to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 19, lies under the sway, that is the control of Satan, the wicked one. This world system filled with the carnal, sinful desires of mankind is a place where a believer can easily get spotted, can easily get stained. There's all kinds of things in this world that can stain our testimony. If we give ourselves over to sin, immorality, drunkenness, thefts, lying, all kinds of things that can stain our reputation and our testimony for Jesus Christ. This world is filled with wars, is it not? Oh yes. Not only wars of nation between nation, but wars between people, people at work, people in families, all kinds of fighting, arguing, all kinds of unfaithfulness. I believe that's how James is using the word adulterers and adulteresses. He's talking about being unfaithful to God. How are we unfaithful to God? When we live for self, when we live for our own selfish desires, when you live for someone else's selfish desires, when the believer should be caught up with what? Pleasing the Lord. Living for God. No longer are we darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. And we're commanded to walk as children of light. That is, in obedience to the will of God 
as revealed in the Word of God, we want to find the way of God. Unspotted means that while we're in this world, we have to be careful, very, very careful. You have to be careful of what groups you associate yourself with. You have to be careful of what friends you have. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you have to be very, very careful because what seemingly starts out is everything's fine, fun, everything's going along fine in the world, it can take a right-hand turn very quickly, very quickly, because they regard not the things of God, they regard not the person of God. And the believer has a sense of diligence to be careful because I know the direction this could easily go in. There are things that I don't do, places that I will not go. Why? Because I know of the pressure and the activity that takes place there. And I don't want to be spotted by the world. I want to be careful. And so that means there's a healthy place of placing different standards that I want to put there. Not that those standards replace the Word of God. They are my own uh, standards that I put there. Why? So that if I go beyond, I could be stained, but I'm going to be careful not to be stained. I'm going to be careful to preserve my testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now sometimes I have to go in certain places where one can be stained. I have no choice. And sometimes I'm going to go there. I have to go to my place of work. Uh, if I need to, I go to the library, but just as much as I can get a good book out of the library, it's filled with all kinds of filth, isn't it? Be careful to keep your testimony unspotted. I can go out into uh, different places and carry about the business of the Lord seeking to honor Him, but I have to be wary, wary. Why? I'm a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, and I have a testimony of my Lord and Savior to be very, very taken up with, and very, very concerned about. So I need God's help, and I want to be unspotted from the world. James here says, if you enter into a friendship with the world, you have now placed yourself in enmity with God, because this world system, as I said, lies under the sway of the wicked one, Satan himself. Jesus called him the ruler of this world. Satan is the ruler of this world, and this world is filled with the carnal desires of people who are fallen and sinful. You need to be very, very careful. And there's plenty of opportunity to be a testimony for the Lord. Keep your testimony unspotted. And may God strengthen us to do that. The second word that Peter uses in 2 Peter chapter 3 as an adjective, it's also an adjective, just like the word spotless is an adjective. It's the word blameless. Will you be found by him in peace blameless? The word here for blameless is a word that means without fault. Without fault. Now, again, uh, if any of us, or if anyone were to construe my words to mean that we don't sin, John deals with that at length in his first epistle, doesn't he? If anyone says that he doesn't sin, he's a liar. We all struggle with that. So how can I be found faultless? John says in verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we've shared together that we need to keep accounts short. When we do fail, we need to run to the Lord in forgiveness of sin. Make it a habit as a part of your intercessory prayer to confess your sins. Why? That you may be, the word of God says, blameless. It doesn't say perfect. God knows that if we were to claim to be perfect, we would be lying. But we are to be found blameless. And that means we do not conduct sin as a habit anymore. No, no, that may have been what I was before I came to know Christ. But now, my habit is to practice righteousness, blameless. And when I sin, I want to be careful to confess my sin. Why? Do you know that God is faithful? Do you know that God is just to forgive us of our sins? I'm telling you, if you're a believer, and you confess your sin, He will forgive it. God will forgive your sin. You don't have to beat yourself up with, I wonder if God really, really forgave me for that. You don't have to beat yourself up with that. He's faithful. He's just. The word just means he's righteous. Why is God righteous to forgive us of our sins? It's not because of you or me, that's for sure. It's because of Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who died and shed his blood to pay for our sins. And if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, God has put the blood of Jesus Christ to your account. And so he's right 
And not only is he right to forgive you, he's also faithful. Why is God faithful to forgive us of our sins? Because that's his nature. He's a faithful God. That's who he is. And so this is a cause for thanksgiving. A real cause for praise to the Lord. Because if you confess, what does confess mean? We ought to understand that. 1 John 1, 9. It means to say the same thing. You know, when we discipline our children, sometimes as parents we're disappointed when our children get caught in wrongdoing, when they're sorry that they got caught. That's not really sufficient. Some children are sorry that they're going to have to or that they got the punishment. And as a parent, you're glad that they're sorry, but not all the way. Because what we're really looking for as a parent is for children to recognize that's wrong. I shouldn't have done it. I was wrong to do it or say it. That's what it means to confess your sin. It means to see your sins the way God sees them. It means to own up to your sin for what it actually is and to say with your mouth to God, I sinned. That's what it means to confess. Not, I'm sorry. Saying you're sorry is a wonderful thing. I'm not saying don't say you're sorry. But if you are not understanding that your sorrow is for what you did, you offended a holy, righteous God when you transgressed, when you committed this wickedness or evil, when you were unthoughtful or unmindful or remiss. There's all different kinds of words for sin, aren't there? I missed the mark, and I did wrong. When we confess our sins, God is faithful, and he's just to forgive us our sins. Why? How else can we be found by him blameless unless we confess our sins. Because if you think you're sinless, you're just a liar. First John chapter one. We make him a liar. No, we struggle, we do fail, but we want to be careful to confess our sins. Why? That we might be blameless without fault. This word comes up in Jude. If you want to turn quickly to Jude, verse 24. The beautiful closing benediction to again another short epistle, this one to Jude, is this. Now to him, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his presence, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. The word faultless here is the word blameless. The same root word that we have in 2 Peter chapter 3 in verse 14. God is able to keep you from stumbling and God is able to present you blameless when Jesus Christ comes. How do we take care of our part? What we need to do is confess our sins. What's God's part? He is faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins. God is able to present you faultless, blameless. How about it? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Are you looking forward to these things that God has said coming to pass? Are you being diligent? Are you pouring your energy and your effort into being found in him in peace without spot and without blameless? They're good exhortations, aren't they? Wonderful exhortations for us to keep in mind. Now let's deal with this phrase, to be found in him in peace. Do you know that God tells us in his word that for the wicked there is no peace? No peace. In Isaiah, two times, God says this statement, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. There is no peace. It's found in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 22. It's found in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 21. The phrase is also found in the Psalms. God says there is no peace for the wicked. What does God say about the wicked? In Isaiah chapter 57, verse 20, God says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea, which it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. By the way, that's why the world will stain you. Because the world is full of wicked people who are constantly casting up, like the waves upon the shore, the muck, the mire, and the dirt of their sin. Be careful. Be careful in the world. God says the wicked are like that, always stirring up evil, 
always stirring up sin. And so God says there is no peace for the wicked. Our Lord Jesus Christ said in John 16, verse 33, in the world you will have tribulation. We've talked about that. That's pressure. All kinds of pressures in the world. Why? Because in this world we live in a place where there is darkness. The darkness of mankind's rejection of God, the sin of his heart under the sway of the wicked one. So in this world there's tribulation and the wicked have no peace. So how can you find peace? How can you find peace? I hope that you not only know, but that you can help other people to find peace. Can you help other people to find true peace? Turn with me please to Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two, in verse 14, I wanna begin in verse 13, Ephesians two in verse 13, Paul, writing to the believers in Ephesus, reminded them that as Gentiles, unbelievers, they were strangers from the promises that God gave to Israel, strangers from the blessing, the covenant, the promises. Unless you became a, um, a proselyte in the Old Testament, you didn't experience the blessings of the covenant that God made with Israel. That does not mean you couldn't be saved without becoming a proselyte. Some people twist those words. How do you become saved? Hebrews chapter 11 is very, very, very clear. Verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so we find people like Naaman, a Syrian, <laughs> took a little dirt with him, but he went back home. He went back home a believer. He wasn't enjoying the blessings of the promises of the covenants of Israel, but he was a believer. We, we read about people like Nebuchadnezzar, don't we? People like Nebuchadnezzar, pagan ruler of a pagan empire, the Babylonian empire, that God humbled so low, he gave him an insanity. You read about it in chapter 4 of Daniel. And when he came to himself, Nebuchadnezzar turned to the Lord and said, Now I praise and extol I bless the God of heaven. He's the one true God. Didn't become a proselyte of the uh, Israelite people and enjoy the blessings of the Sinaitic covenant, but he was a believer. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about people like Abraham, Enoch, Noah, and Abel who never followed the Sinaitic covenant because there wasn't one yet. All of them believers. How? By faith. By faith. By faith. Each and every one. How does a person come into a right relationship with God? You must believe in God. And in this day and age, God has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ, his son, his son who came and died for us. And so, verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 2, But now, right now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ, for he himself is is our peace who has made both one Jews and Gentiles and has broken down the middle wall of separation that was the law given in commandments at Mount Sinai the rest of the context explains that how can a person have peace you need to come to Jesus Christ and trust him as your Savior it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse you from your sins and bring you into peace with God because Jesus is the only peace He's the only one. This is powerful. And that's why you'll read in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have and you know that peace, can you help someone else find it? I hope so. I hope you can take some people to some simple verses, like John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you believe, God will justify you. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Therefore, will you be found in peace only if you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? The Lord Jesus Christ, who, as I said in John 16, verse 33, said, in this world you have, will have tribulation, he said to his disciples, these things I have spoken to you, that in me, Jesus said, you may have peace. 
Jesus said to his disciples, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Hmm. Do you know what that word overcome means? To conquer. To overcome is to conquer. How did Jesus overcome the world? He conquered it. He conquered it. How did he do that? It began on the cross when he shed his blood to pay for our sins and cried out the words, it is finished. And set in motion the events that he's coming back as a ruling, reigning king. And by war, he will put down any and all opposition, spiritual, physical, any kind of opposition exists. Jesus will put it down all. We saw about that the day of the Lord. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And so what did he offer to those who believe in him? Peace. In me, in me, you will have peace. We find true peace through faith in Jesus Christ. But not only that. Turn with me as we close this morning to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And again, I trust you know it so well. I trust you know it so well that you can share it with others. To those who have found peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ, God promises something very wonderful in verse 7. I'll begin in verse 6 of Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you know that God promises to his children who come to him in simple faith praying a peace that passes understanding. You know it. Yes, God promises that peace to each one who looks to him in faith, each one who comes to him in faith boldly before his throne of grace. God gives peace. That doesn't mean he will necessarily remove the storm. Sometimes he does. In Mark, Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, we read about the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came to his disciples, they were in the boat, and all the storm was raging around them. Jesus said, Peace! Be still! And all of a sudden, the storm stopped, and there was a great calm. Wow. God can quell any storm. He can calm any storm. But to the Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul was beset by a physical affliction, he was beset by what Paul called his thorn in the flesh. When he asked Jesus three times, Lord, take it away, Jesus said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. And Paul came away saying, I will gladly boast and rejoice in my weaknesses and infirmities. Could God heal Paul? Oh, yeah. How many accounts do we have in the Gospels of people who were healed by the Lord Jesus Christ? He can heal anyone he wants to, but sometimes he doesn't want to heal someone. Sometimes he wants to flood their heart and their life with his grace so that you can say like Paul, most gladly, therefore, will I joy in my affliction, my infirmity. Why? Because he found the strength of God to give him peace in the midst of his storm. Peace. The only way to be found by Jesus Christ in peace is to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and to be walking with him day by day. Are you looking and watching for the Lord? Are you diligent for him each and every day that you may be found by him in peace, unspotted, not spotted by the world, not stained by the things that are in the world, not spotted by the lusts that are in the world, but blameless and faultless because you pursue your relationship with God day by day, coming to Him. Through faith in Jesus Christ, God promises all of this to each and every one who trusts in Him. I want to close reading a poem to you. When life's burdens get so heavy, and it seems I'm all alone, I cast my care on Jesus and come boldly to His throne. I find his...